Well, welcome to First Parish in Beverly, Unitarian Universalist. I am really excited to look out and see a whole bunch of people that I know, but also a whole bunch of people I don't know. Um, so let me just give you a brief orientation. We have an accessible restroom through this door and then around the corner to the left. There are other restrooms downstairs, which you are certainly welcome to use, but they aren't accessible. Um, there is, even if you take the elevator down, there is one step up. So if that feels okay, you're certainly welcome to use them. Or take the stairs, which are out this door. All of our restrooms are not gendered. So I am the Reverend Elizabeth Asenza. I use she, her pronouns. And I have the privilege of serving as this congregation's minister. In our congregation, we've spent some time this year in deep exploration of our values, which you can see in the circles and the mural on the back wall. So as an aside, we welcome all who come through our doors adding their own thoughts. So if you read one of those questions and you want to add your thoughts, there's a way to contribute to that wall. And feel free if any of these questions call to you as you uh, leave later in the evening. One of the shared values between the multiple faiths or people of no faith who are represented here this evening is that of caring for our community. When Jay Coburn, who will introduce himself in a moment, first brought the idea of tonight's conversation on homelessness and housing insecurity to me, I knew it would center that community care work we both prioritize and know we can engage much more fully in. For a number of years, I have been looking at our work of community care as work that is an ever-expanding circle. It invites us to ask these questions. Who within our, the circle, who is within the circle of our community? Who is not yet included in the circle of our community? How do we do the work of widening the circle? And how can our work center people on the margins? In Beverly, we are fortunate to have some programs that other cities and towns do not yet have. At times, we might lift up our good work of community care in celebration, but I caution you to also take an honest look at the needs that are not yet met in our community and the people or communities who are underserved. Tonight, leaders from Family Promise, LifeBridge, and River House are going to bring us an honest reflection of the needs they see in our city every day. I hope that this is just a starting point for multi-faith work that expands the direct care for those in our community who are unhoused. So I'll close my brief time by sharing some lyrics of a group called the Common Cup Company, which have been tumbling through my head these past few weeks with a, a slight language update uh, to be more inclusive. Draw the circle wide, draw it wider still. Let this be our song, no one is alone. We'll be side by side. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. May it be so. Good evening, all. I'm Jay Coburn. My pronouns are he and him. I serve on the Social Action Committee here at First Parish, and I'm on the board at LifeBridge. Um, thanks to the Social Action Committee and Paul Drake and others uh, for hosting this gathering. And thanks to a, a number of elected officials. We have Steve Crowley. Steve, hello. Scott Hausman. Danielle Spang. Hi, Scott. Thank you. Hi, Danielle. Um, Rose Kubitos from uh, Representative Paracella's office. Thank you. And Lorinda Visnick. Hi, Lorinda. And we're having fun, right? 
<laughs> All right, great. Um, is there anybody I missed who's, who's doing that good work of the civic work that you all have spent another evening doing tonight? Oh, okay, well thank you for coming. Um, special thanks to you all for making this time on a beautiful evening. I wish I could say it was going to be this nice tomorrow, so don't worry. Um, the inspiration for this program began last year, and it began when Beverly Police came to First Parish with a complaint against six named individuals who were frequently uh, enjoying Ellis Square next door and sometimes sleeping on our steps. Uh, this prompted a minor blow up within our congregation and a, and a couple of meetings. And uh, in the meetings, we debated our responsibilities, uh, both to unhoused neighbors and to the larger community, um, in the context of, of our values as Unitarian Universalists. And during the meetings, several folks realized that there are things maybe going on in neighboring cities that aren't present here. And the agreement was made that we would try to learn more about what is happening in the community of homeless and housing insecure residents of Beverly and what opportunities might there be to meet the, those folks needs better. Um, we made it our plan to meet with organizations who knew about these things and two of them are here tonight LifeBridge North Shore and Family Promise North Shore Boston. LifeBridge serves uh, individuals from Lynn to Gloucester and Family Promise uh, focuses on families in Essex County. Tonight their leaders will share what they've learned from serving and we'll have an opportunity to ask, get, to ask their questions and get some answers. As you probably know and will hear, the challenge of homelessness is more than just the well-publicized lack of affordable housing, more than limited treatment options for people experiencing mental health distress, more than medical and legal systems that struggle to deal with addiction, and more than our society's conflicted attitudes about social safety nets. In fact, these well-publicized stressors only account for a fraction of the homelessness problem. Other things like low wages, inaccessible and unaffordable childcare, others, even more common causes of homelessness. Um, homelessness can result from a convergence of any of these factors or just from a particularly bad luck. We are all eligible. The challenges of homelessness are diverse and they're changing over time. Our goal tonight is to learn and to decide how we can help build community awareness of and support for the needs of Beverly's unhoused and housing insecure residents. This is one step, we won't learn it all tonight. The needs are large and growing, we need to find ways to catch up. As the program continues, if you have a question you'd like to address to any of the speakers, um, please raise your hand and we'll get a card and a pencil in your hand so you can write it down. We're gonna have a good chunk of time for question and answer and it'll help a lot if the questions come in in advance so we can get them spread out to the, the right answer and go through as much as you may have in the way of questions before we break. Um, and if you need to leave before the end of the program and we don't already have your contact information, we'd love to take it on a clipboard with any preferences you might have about being informed about similar events, about um, training opportunities for your supper program or your community group, all those kinds of things. Um, it, not sure who would answer it, but we've got a couple of competent organizations and we've got others who, who can do this kind of work in the community. Um, so. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Rachel Hand, Executive Director at Family Promise, North Shore, Boston, who's going to get us started. Thank you. I'll get this out of here. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Rachel Hand. My pronouns are she, her. And as um, Jay mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of Family Promise. So just a quick what is Family Promise? We're a local homeless services agency that focuses on families experiencing homelessness in Essex County. And what does that mean? Um, you know, for the, a long period of time, we've been in existence working with families for about 10 years, and most of that was focused on emergency shelter. In the last 
three to four years, we started to see a, a real need for trying to meet families before they ended up um, in a situation where they needed shelter. So we do what's called prevention, homelessness prevention, and some shelter diversion, um, and also helping families access shelter because that's a whole other um, issue that's happening right now. So we'd, we'd work, uh, there's, we're small staff, um, there's four of us on staff, and we work with a few hundred families, or we receive calls from at least a few hundred families every year, and we do our best to try and advocate and make sure that they have proper access to housing. So that's Family Promise. And I have the privilege of kind of starting off this uh, conversation, which means I can say whatever I want, and then they have to figure it out after. So. <laughs> But I, I think, you know, there's um, something to keep in mind when we talk about homelessness is there are, are different populations of homelessness, and each population requires different resources and intensive work. And so Jason and I talk about this a lot because I think they, people will often hear, homelessness, you can help anyone. Um, yes, we can. We're all very great at what we do. But there's a reason why certain agencies focus on different things like families or youth and young adult homelessness, veteran homelessness, individuals um, who aren't veterans. So I think that's important to note because what I want to talk about right now is what does this mean for this conversation as it relates to the folks um, that you often see on the streets here in Beverly. And I think the best way to kind of start this is to give you an idea of what that, what that population represents when it comes to the overall term of homelessness. So oftentimes what we see becomes our idea of what it is. And that's not the case in most situations, and particularly when it comes to homelessness. And so what we often find is um, people who are often outside stairs can usually meet the definition of what's called chronic homelessness. And to meet that definition, you need a period of length of time of being homeless up to a year. And typically, you have some type of diagnosis that um, can, makes you disabled by the definition that HUD put out. That percentage of people experiencing homelessness. In Massachusetts in 2023, it was only 14% of people experiencing homelessness. 39% of people experiencing homelessness in 2023 were 18 years old and younger. And the remaining 50% of people experiencing homelessness fall into a category of adults that are either the parents in those family situations or someone who is down on their luck. Um, you may not see them in the same way that we see some of the chronic folks because they try to hide it. You know, they're, they're wearing a suit and tie, they're trying to blend in. When it comes to families, you don't see families very often for similar reasons because there's a lot of stigma around what homelessness is. I think what's important to note in this particular conversation is that when we start to assume the stigma is representative of the whole problem, then we start to put our ideas of what homelessness is on everybody experiencing it. And that can be incredibly problematic for so many reasons. As it relates to families, what we often see when families call our office they're very apologetic. They try to explain why they're in this situation. They don't want to be categorized into like, you know, they are struggling with substance use disorder or something like that. And I always am like, you don't have to justify this. Like, you don't have to apologize. The reason you're homeless has nothing to do with these things, and that's the case for almost everyone. Massachusetts, the wages in Massachusetts do not cover the rent, and that is truly like the main reason why most people are homeless, and the fact that we don't have enough housing to bring those rental costs down. So when you have the greater percentage of people experiencing homelessness not fitting what we see, we have to kind of recognize that we have a duty to treat the visible with dignity and respect in such a way that the majority feel comfortable asking for help. So often, nobody feels comfortable asking for help because they believe that if someone finds out we're homeless, they're going to think X, Y, Z about me. So families hide. People who don't necessarily have some of the things that we're seeing publicly don't want to con explain that they're homeless. They might show up to LifeBridge and not want to express that, so they don't get the services that they need when we create that situation. And this means it's our responsibility to practice behaviors publicly 
that show everybody it's okay and it's not your fault and you should seek help and I know how to get you that help. Here, you know, I work with these people, you can give them a call. Um, there's so many things this community can do to try and help people who are experiencing homelessness find the resources they need. And it starts with treating everybody with the same amount of dignity and respect. And then in terms of Beverly, I think, um, there's a gross misunderstanding of how many people are experiencing homelessness in Beverly. And the reality is, is homelessness is more visible and prevalent in communities where the resources exist. And Beverly is lacking in resources. And so when we think that there's no homelessness in Beverly, it's more that when people experience homelessness, they end up having to leave Beverly to get the resources that they need. But that's not also always the case because Family Promise is in Beverly and we still get calls on a regular basis. So I thought it would be relevant to share, you know, again, we're a very small agency. In the last three weeks, we've received nine different calls from families seeking services to either prevent eviction, access shelter, or maybe sleeping in their cars. That's just in the last three weeks. So to give you an idea of is there homelessness in Beverly, at least as it pertains to families, I can say 100% yes. And I know that the same is the case for folks who are falling into the individual category. So ultimately, I think, um, I don't know how long I've been speaking because I just keep going. No, no, I, I, I'm running out of things to say, but I just mostly, <laughs> I was mostly saying like, <clears throat> Great. Okay, great. I mostly just wanted to say it. I was going to wrap it up, but I also um, could talk for hours. And I'm happy to if anyone wants to come talk to me after this. Um, but ultimately, I think what I wanted to convey before these very wonderful folks come up here is that um, what we see does not always represent what there is, but we have to work together to make sure that we're solving this problem together and treating everyone the same because you truly do not know who you're interacting with and whether or not they're experiencing homelessness. So when you do know someone who is experiencing homelessness, that's the perfect place to start. So I truly, I commend this congregation. You guys have been incredibly supportive of Family Promise, anyone here who's a member, but having this conversation is the start of a lot of good work. Um, and thank you all for being here too because it says a lot about your commitment to this and your desire to be educated. So I'm excited to have you learn more from these wonderful folks. Thank you. My grandmother would be very proud to see me standing in a pulpit. <laughs> um, so vanity has prevented me from addressing the inevitable, which is that I actually need bifocals now. Um, so I'm going to do my best to uh, switch here. So um, what I wanted to talk a little bit about tonight is uh, give you sort of a picture of nationally what we're looking at with um, unhoused individuals and then bring that down to kind of the local level to give you a sense of what we at LifeBridge are seeing both in Salem, Gloucester, and also uh, through the work that my colleague Chelsea is doing here uh, with the River House Shelter. So we'll talk a little bit about what this looks like. Uh, so according to the last point in time count, so for those of you who are not familiar, Every year at the end of January, we go out and we attempt to count all of the unhoused people. We typically grossly undercount the number. We don't capture the people who are living on couches or finding places to kind of hide away, but it's the best kind of tool we have at our disposal. So um, the last point in time count revealed nationwide about a 12% increase in the number of unhoused individuals. So not trending in a great direction. Um, so to give you a sense of what we're looking at nationwide, of course, the things that many of us think about when we think about unhoused individuals, we're talking about mental illness. Um, so when we look at the rates of serious mental illness, and by that I mean major depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, we're looking at about 15 to 20 percent of the unhoused population as compared to about 5 percent in the general population. Um, and that rate is significantly higher among unhoused women. Um, 
some studies are actually placing the rate of um, major mental illness closer to 30% among the unhoused. Um, if you look at, say, any mental health issue, including anxiety disorders, uh, depression, ADHD especially, that rate jumps to almost 75%. Um, the other thing we often, unfortunately, think about and, and in many cases see right before us is the relationship between substance use disorders and uh, homelessness. This is an interesting kind of chicken or the egg problem. Um, so yes, people become homeless because they develop a substance use disorder. Uh, sadly, my colleagues and I often see people who wind up becoming homeless who graduate to a significant substance use disorder. Um, so we're looking at, uh, according to national data, about 38% of unhoused individuals have um, some sort of dependency on alcohol or some other drug. Um, by comparison, the rate is about 8% in the general population. So that's at what we're kind of looking at in the national data. Um, the other thing that um, is of particular concern to us um, that is coming out of the data is that single unattached women are the fastest growing rate uh, among the unhoused. Um, this was the impetus behind taking the River House shelter here in Beverly and converting that over to a women's specific shelter and increasing the number of women's beds that we have uh, in the shelter in Salem. Uh, my colleague Chelsea, who runs that program for us, is going to talk about it. Um, the reason the needs of women are so important to us is because women are at particular risk when they become unhoused. Um, they are at significantly higher risk of being trafficked. Um, they experience much higher rates of major depressive disorder, much higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, sadly, and many of us who do this work see this a lot, are um, significantly higher risk for being sexually assaulted while they're on the streets. So um, again, my colleague Chelsea will talk a little bit more about what we're doing to try to ameliorate that. Um, so what are we seeing here locally? Well, it tracks largely within what we're seeing nationally. Uptick in the number of unattached women. Um, Jason, I don't know if you remember off the top of your head, what is it, sometimes up to 10 a day, oh. dozens and dozens per week, women calling in for shelter beds that we're turning away because we don't have space for them. Um, we are seeing a significant increase in substance use disorders, especially around the use of opioids, methamphetamine, and cocaine. Um, and also major mental illnesses with co-occurring substance use disorders. Something else has sort of come to my attention in the, the last two years that I've been with LifeBridge. Uh, I was a social work professor at Salem State for about 10 years uh, before Jason uh, hired me away. And something that doesn't come up in the literature a whole lot, um, but really needs to be looked at, is that we, uh, especially Ben and myself, see a very high rate of neurodevelopmental disorders among the populations that we serve. And there's very, very little being said. And by that I mean people with autism spectrum disorder, people with traumatic brain injuries, and people with intellectual disabilities, right? So often we're talking about people who have not just one diagnosis, say, a mental illness. They're a triple diagnosis. It is a mental illness, it's a substance use disorder, and then it's some kind of neurodevelopmental um, disorder. And it is extremely, extremely challenging to find stable housing for people who meet all of those criteria. And, um, you know, I stay up on the literature and I don't see it being discussed a whole lot, that issue. Um, I think we often have in, in our heads this image of um, what a homeless person looks like or how somebody winds up homeless. And people are often surprised at the sheer number of seniors we are now bringing into our shelter. 
Um, when I describe the population we're working with locally, I describe it as a bimodal distribution. We have a big group of younger people. We also have a large group of older adults who are utilizing our services, often for very different reasons, right? Our younger folks, these are the folks with, um, who are really struggling with mental illness, struggling with substance use disorders. Our older folks um, are struggling with disabilities and are living in shelters, chronic health uh, problems and are living in a shelter. Um, they become homeless because their fixed income no longer pays for a place to live. Um, a spouse becomes ill, a spouse dies, they themselves become ill. Um, we have had older adults who have been defrauded for, of their retirement savings and have wound up in our shelter. So it is a very diverse group of people. Um, I want to conclude with um, sort of a, a bigger issue. That's kind of the nuts and bolts and the, and the data. And with apologies to uh, two of my students who are here with us who uh, have heard this uh, tale this semester already. Um, I had my students this semester read uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And one of the things, the kind of ongoing conversations I always have with, with my colleagues is that, yes, housing is an important part of what we need to do and the services are an important part, they're necessary, but they are not adequate. Several years ago, a couple of economists started talking about this concept called deaths of despair. And when they talk about a death of despair, what they're talking about is people who are dying due to a substance use disorder. Um, they're dying because they're drinking themselves to death. Um, and sadly, if you look at the data, the rate of suicide especially among young to middle-aged men, is going up significantly. And so when you look at these deaths of despair, that is not fixed simply by housing somebody. So there's this kind of existential crisis that we're facing. So perhaps it's fitting that we're here in a congregation um, talking about this issue because it's not just about the housing. It's the problem of purposelessness, placelessness, um, the need for meaning. Um, Frankel quotes uh, Nietzsche when he says that um, a man who has a why can bear almost any how. And what we are seeing with the clients we're working with is that they don't have the why. If you have the why, you can kind of pull yourself through an awful lot. So Jason and I talk all the time about how LifeBridge is part of the solution, but we are not all of the solution. It is the community, the source of meaning and the source of place that is a big part of the solution. Um, the The nuts and bolts, the policy advocacy work is absolutely critical. It's something we all need to be engaged in locally, at the state level, at the federal level, and we all do that. But I think that just as important is the convening of groups like this who find the common cause and to make sure that we are welcoming in our unhoused neighbors to allow people to, again, sort of recapture meaning. So. Next, up. Uh, next up is Ben Morgan. Uh, ben is the uh, director of behavioral services at Life Bridge. We'll talk about meeting people where they're at. Um, thank you, Jay. There was some debate at LifeBridge um, about the uh, grammar involved in the phrase meeting people where they're at. Um, I'm here to state on the record that amongst us social workers, uh, this is one that we embrace. We reference a lot of things really frequently. Uh, we have, as it sounds like, there's a couple of students here uh, very aware 
we will drill the, the, the social work code of ethics into our students, uh, but the phrase meeting people where they're at is as close as it comes to a holy dictum. Um, the idea being that you, you can't do much for people when you show up to do something with them and then rely on their kind of just getting it. Um, without connection, um, we don't have traction. We don't have, we don't have any shared movement. We can't move together until we find a place to meet. And I, I had some notions about how to go about talking about this subject um, after criticizing but just reinforcing the grammar. Um, and after debating with Jay about the irony of a conversation about meeting people where they're at from a podium where I'm substantially above other people. Uh, Come on down. I mean, I, I offered, blame him, I'm, I'm, I'm blameless here. Uh, I will meet you there soon. Um, what goes up must come down. No, I, I, as I actually kind of expected to, I scrapped a lot of my notes uh, while Dr. Lukens was speaking. And I think maybe it would be more useful just to tell you a little bit about how I got my job at LifeBridge. Um, as I think, uh, I, I think Dr. Lukens' students may have been told this story as well, so uh, we we're just gonna just go over everything again. Um, a few years ago, I accepted a job uh, with uh, Leahy Health Behavioral Services, now Beth Israel Leahy Health Behavioral Services. There's several other names there. I don't know, mergers. It was a job that found me doing co-response with a couple of area police departments to calls to 911 involving uh, mental health concerns or things that were suspected to be maybe mental health concerns. Um, I grew up some of my earliest memories were in a Unitarian congregation in Billings, Montana, um, just down the street from where Dr. Lukens got his first college degree, in fact. Um, I, I've grown up uh, having some suspicions and concerns about a lot of practices in American policing. Those have been reaffirmed over the course of my life. Um, when I was first offered this job, I turned it down, but over time and over more observ observations, I, I came to the conclusion that if somebody wants to improve the way they handle something and they're asking me for help, then I want to help them do that. And I found that I was able to do that pretty, pretty regularly and I was very pleased about that. Um, one day, while I'm spending time with the Salem Police Department, uh, we receive a call to go to 56 uh, Margin Street. It's, this is the main LifeBridge shelter address. Um, anybody who works in Salem with any challenged population for any length of time will know the address. We know what that is. Um, we'd been there, we met with the staff. Um, I had a, a good relationship with some of them. I've always liked working with the LifeBridge staff. Um, we arrived to find that there's a gentleman standing on the sidewalk in front of the shelter. Um, this gentleman is probably mid-30s. Um, I guess there was a, maybe a physical altercation with another client in the shelter. We also know that he's got a psychotic disorder. He's not thinking very clearly at all and he's having some religious delusions. Um, it, they're not consistent, they're not totally coherent, and he's not well. And as I am walking up and I'm getting a little bit of this information, um, we kind of gauge that he's calm right now, so the officers that I'm with, they sort of hold back a little bit, but they're keeping an eye on me and I appreciate it. And the reason I bring this up is because it is now my responsibility to figure out how I'm going to meet this gentleman where he's at with what I know about him and, and that's really all that I've, I've just shared with you. There's the added problem that the LifeBridge Vice President, who was my own social work professor, is standing there watching me do this, but take that out of the equation, you're not worried about that part. We're only worried about the part that we know that this person is so profoundly different from us, from, from, from anybody who's having an experience in this room right now. He is, we, we don't know exactly how he's thinking, we know that he's been violent with somebody recently, and we know that he's gonna be asked to leave the shelter not because they wanna get rid of him, but because they, they can't maintain safety while he's there in this state. How do we approach somebody like that? Well, I, I was lucky that I had people keeping an eye on me, but ultimately, I, I made a choice, and the choice was to approach him and just say, man, this is rough. <laughs> 
that's all I had. Um, and he agreed. Okay. <laughs> all right. We're, we're somewhere. Um, and something I've learned over many, many tries is that, you know what, if I don't really understand the nature of somebody's delusion, that might be okay if I just say, I'm sorry, I don't understand that. <laughs> and I, I said, hey, I, I'm not, I know that people are kind of worried about some of the things that you're saying, um, but I'm more worried about you and, and, and what you're comfortable with, because I know people are asking you to leave. Um, so I just want to make sure that whatever your, your next step is, is going to be okay. And yeah, it turns out that was kind of his biggest problem too. So, all right, we've got more in common. Ultimately, um, you know, one of the, the options that we have on the table is that we can take him to get some help over to the Salem Hospital Emergency Room where they have people that can recognize what's going on and help sort things out and work these things out. And I think my estimation, though I, I don't believe that I ever encountered him again, was that his, the level of severity of his illness would probably be able to be controlled with, with fairly straightforward medication that we have really ready access to, but I also know that he's unhoused. So there are a lot of these connections that don't always get made from the moment that he is gonna be discharged from the hospital to the next time that he encounters somebody who's responding to something that's only happening because those connections didn't get made. Um, I, I, I was honored to be able to have that experience. Um, and it, again, it's, it's how I wound up before you today, but I guess I wanna, I wanna take a step back and also kind of frame this, this whole concern. We have a little bit of, of, of challenges that we like to do with people to try to, to maybe motivate some thinking. So that's the level that I wanna, that I wanna work on right now. And I think I, we often, when we have our, our discussions, and, and I will say we have some lovely, semi-intellectual venting sessions around the shelter, we, the word deinstitutionalization comes up a lot. And, and I, I have a suspicion that this is a self-selecting audience and that many people in here came today because they have some notion about maybe what that word is and what it means. And for anybody else, and I welcome you aboard, it's the notion that at one point in this country, many of the people that we see and call neighbors today who don't have homes would be locked against their will into a facility, an institution, a hospital, whatever you want to call it. Danvers State Hospital was formerly Danvers State Lunatic Asylum, Danvers State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, a number of other, of other uh, uh, names. Um, the notion that we could find, or the notion that maybe there exists a better way to help people than simply locking them in a building and making sure that they have three meals a day, that notion is lovely. Um, that notion is great. We want to do that. We got to make sure that we're having the conversation with the individuals involved, but we want to do it. And here's where the, the, the thought experiment comes in. Now it's you responding. Apologies. What, your challenge is now to figure out how to meet all of those people where they're at. Um, we have ideas of policy, we have ideas of programming, we have ideas of funding sources, and we have ideas of, of where to point things. Um, we, have, we have training, we have evidence, we have research, we have practice, we have all sorts of wonderful tools at our disposal. We know they exist, but what happened, as many people here again may be aware, is that over the course of the 50s and into the 70s when it started with people with mental health concerns and ended up with people with, with uh, developmental disabilities, we said, we have a better idea for you. You can go now. And that was the end of the conversation. And I've talked to these people in the course of my work. This wasn't so long ago that people who got discharged from a hospital under those circumstances were, said, were, were told, we have a better plan, go ahead. And then, and then they met with very little. Um, I think that's a, that's a commonly understood problem, but when you are that person, where do you put yourself? I think Dr. Lukens made reference to this notion of having a why. 
And I think one of the things that clearly caused people to gather here tonight was that there are questions in this community about why. Why is a person occupying space next to this building? Why are they there? That's a really worthwhile question. And I think that that's the one where if you, if you want to meet somebody where they're at, ask them why they're there. What brought you there? Where are the things? You don't have to go approach every person you see on the street, but have the question ready. Have those simple things ready because those simple things are universal and we can use them every day. It's how I get along with my coworkers. Every day. <laughs> Keep it simple. That's the important thing. Um, I think I should wrap up at this point. We'll be here. Thank you very much. everyone for being here. It's my first time being able to come and share about the work that we're doing. Um, so we opened River House officially on September 5th of last year. Um, we had 12 beds and we have been full ever since. We are, have now increased our bed capacity to 14 and we also have cots that we put up for emergency situations in our dining room. Um, we turn away I would say between five to ten women a day and sometimes in the middle of the night we'll get calls and a woman just needs a safe space. Um, typically they're fleeing domestic violence, um, they're having a mental health crisis and what we found is that the domestic violence shelters and the family shelters are full so there's no space for them. Um, and unfortunately if somebody's fleeing domestic violence and they don't have a safe place to go they end up going back to their abuser or out to the streets to experience more trauma and we really do our best to keep women safe. Um, you know the women that we work with they struggle with mental health, they're working through trauma, trauma that they've experienced throughout their lives um, and we do this we provide intense case management services and then we have our behavioral health department Ben and we have Jonathan and they're always willing to come down and talk to a woman who's in crisis. Um, and case management looks different for everyone. Um, it goes from getting women IDs or doing housing applications or just being a person that can sit there and listen to them and hold their stories because they haven't been able to share that with anybody else. Um, you know, women, they come in and they feel hopeless and we're able to be the people that hold that hope for them. Um, and also to be their biggest advocate because there is so much stigma around homelessness, substance use disorder, mental health, domestic violence, um, and it creates so many barriers for them to get employment, housing, um, yeah, so it's really important that they have someone there with them to be a voice for them until they find theirs. Um, yeah, so at River House we do provide groups. Um, we have groups, we have coping skills, um, we have some women come in to build a garden with our guests there, um, poetry group, exercise group, and it really kind of makes this feeling of community. Um, we are a very small shelter and what I've seen there, especially I work late some nights and I'll hear the woman cooking dinner together and it has to be one of the most beautiful things because I hear them identifying with each other, giving each other advice, lifting each other up and just coming together to cook and make meals. Um, you know, Christmas and Thanksgiving, they requested that. We don't have any volunteers come in and cook. They asked for the ingredients. And when I asked them why, they said, because some of us don't have families to cook for, and we really want to cook for each other because I feel like this is a family. Um, and it's, it's a community where long-lasting friendships have been made. Um, some women have moved out, and they still talk to other women who are in the shelter. They provide them with resources, meet them for lunch. Um, and when one of them falls down, the other one's there to pick them up. Um, so yeah, 
I had notes and now I'm all off, so I'm not going to look anymore. <laughs> um, you know, I, I really want to humanize this, right? Like, the, pe the people that we work with, they're people, right? They're sisters, they're daughters, they're mothers, um, men too. Um, you know, we have the youngest woman that I've had was 18 and the eldest was 72. Um, I have a 19-year-old girl that was kicked out of her house due to our sexuality. Um, and she decided to come to River House and she's been supported the whole entire way through. Um, and now she's on her way to Job Corps in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, I have a woman that just got released from prison and she was given a housing voucher through a program within MCI Framingham. And, you know, she's met, had so many barriers because of her record. And today, one of our case managers from Salem went with her to look at an apartment. And what she said to the landlord was, I just need a chance. I have a criminal record because I'm homeless and I'm so tired, right? She's 58 years old and she just needs a roof over her head, right? She's ready for that. So people need to be given chances, right? We need more friendly landlords who are willing to overlook certain things. Um, I have another woman that we're working with and she's like 32 years old. Um, she came to us from a police officer. She was abused by somebody who got sentenced and the cycle continues. Because when women are on the streets, they look for someone to protect them and they end up attaching themselves to a man who's probably not the safest person. Um, so she's been in and out about three times and recently she showed up um, at River House covered in blood. and. When our staff went out there to talk to her, she didn't want to say anything. And all they did was take her in and clean her up and then put her in an ambulance. No questions asked. Sorry. Um, you know, and she came back and she's starting to feel safe and build trust with us. And we're starting to be able to like work on goals to get her closer to getting back to her children. Um, so our shelter is just so much more than just a roof over their heads and three meals a day. Um, it's a family and it's a community, and that's so important because we all need human connection. Um, isolation is not good for anyone, especially somebody struggling with their mental health. So like when you see people congregating, a lot of them are actually housed and they're formerly homeless individuals who don't want to be isolated in their room by themselves because it, you know, they begin to decomp and it doesn't end well. So they're there to support each other and have that time. Um, I think one of the most amazing things I've heard since I, we opened the shelter is women say, this is the safest I felt in all of my life. Um, and it just goes to show me that we made the right move by tr transitioning it into a women's shelter and that we're really doing our jobs there. Um, and like we put blood, sweat, and tears. Dr. Lukens actually did our whole entire kitchen. <laughs> um, so yeah, I appreciate everybody coming out here to learn more, um, and yeah. <laughs>
to not have access to housing, to lose housing, um, to not being in communities, gentr uh, like simple things, redlining, um, I, what's it, the covenants that happened, Beverly had a bunch of them, there's literal mortgages, um, what am I, can't, deeds, thank you, that have written words currently saying that people of color can't purchase this home. When you spend years building up systems to keep people out, it's going to work. And so it's gonna take years of rebuilding these systems, preferably by tearing them down in the first place, before people of color are gonna start to see that resources are available to them and that they can access housing. So um, basically I think I, the answer to this question is across the board there are marginalized communities within this marginalized community of homelessness and as it relates to race um, specifically, it's completely disproportional. And we see that all the time at Family Promise, and I'm certain it's very common among the LifeBridge folks as well. So hopefully that answers what people were asking. Okay. Um, yeah, if, okay, let's do the next one. Um, Jonathan, we'll go to you. Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, how many homeless are currently unsheltered in the city of Beverly? Um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, it's, that's actually very difficult to, uh, to assess. Um, what we have seen, actually I should have brought Mike King, he's our outreach person. He, he generally has a really good sense of the number of street homeless or unsheltered people. Um, here in Beverly, uh, and I believe Beverly does have an anti-camping ordinance on the books. Um, what we understand about the unhoused population in Beverly, it is that it is much better hidden, um, probably out of necessity. So if you go down along the rivers and things like that, you will see tents pushed back into the woods, out of sight, out of mind. Um, so whereas, of course, you go to Salem and most people are, are very aware of the encampment that's sort of right in the middle of town there behind the Wendy's, um, here in uh, Beverly, the, that population tends to be a little bit um, more hidden. Um, what I can tell you is um, having sat at the River House shelter, there is no shortage of phone calls that are coming in for people looking for, for shelter. Um, but in terms of account, I, I wish I had that. And actually, it's, I've been talking with our, um, our outreach director, Mike King, um, and if it were possible to make him work 80 hours a week, I could probably get him to take this on as well. Um, but we do need to start doing more outreach here to get a better sense of what the, the street homeless population looks like here in, uh, in Beverly. Did you want me to take the housing first one? Would you like to give it a shot? Okay. We'll see who they like that. Okay. Um, when will Beverly have a housing first program? Um, as a college professor, I'm about to talk about three and a half hours on this topic. Um, so Housing First, for those of you who are not familiar, Housing First is a program that started in uh, New York City by a man named Sam Sambaris. Um, and what Sam did is decided that for a particular subgroup of the unhoused, so he was mostly looking at people with severe and persistent mental illness, people with substance use disorders. In other words, the people who really struggled with the traditional shelter system, um, he said that actually what you need to do is house them first. So before you talk about treatment, you need to attend to basic needs of safety and security. Um, and so literally um, Pathways to Housing in New York, I worked for Pathways to Housing in Philadelphia, finds apartments, sublets them, put somebody into that apartment, and then the ideal model is then you assign an assertive community treatment team to that person who is checking in with them regularly, getting their meds, working on treatment, things like that. Um, when will we get one here in Beverly? Here's the challenge. Um, this is the challenge for all of our folks. West Philadelphia, um, I always want to sing Fresh Prince of Bel-Air every time I say that. Um, West Philadelphia has an abundance of inexpensive apartments 
that landlords want to rent out. Beverly and Salem does not have that. And so the challenge is finding an adequate number of places where we could do housing first. So half of it's what? We find the apartment, we establish that, we lease, we sublet to the person. Here's where we often fall short here in Massachusetts, which is that we get the apartment, but then we do not provide people with the supportive services that will help them remain stable in that apartment. And the data for Housing First in Massachusetts does not look good. The reoccupancy rate after about 16 months is extremely low. Um, by comparison, um, LifeBridge operates permanent supportive housing. Our reoccupancy rate after like 10 years is like 94%. Intensive level of services right there available to our folks. Um, so there are Housing First programs. Um, a lot of it has to do with obviously identifying the funding, but again, my concern with it, and I am definitely a housing first guy, um, my concern is that if we do not do it properly, provide people the support and services they need, we are setting them up to fail. And here in the Commonwealth, if you get a notice to quit, if you are evicted, your name winds up in a database, and that follows you everywhere you go and makes it that much harder for people to get rehoused. So um, this is a very roundabout um, way for me saying, when are we going to get housing first? I'm still waiting for it, period, in a meaningful, substantive way. Um, but um, if somebody wants to write a check to LifeBridge, I will do it tomorrow. I always say, come up with the funding and I will we will make it happen like tomorrow, but it has to be done properly with supportive services, lest we wind up just setting people up to fail. We'll also take your apartments, Yes. Your Airbnbs, whatever. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, I had a, just to, to tack on, I had a conversation with a, a provider recently, um, some of the Housing First funds that exist in Massachusetts are, uh, are awarded to um, state contractors who then kind of uh, administer programs to, to develop uh, those things as resources. I talked to one such provider recently who was allocated, I think, 45 vouchers for Housing First units that they had to then kind of, they had to identify the units with landlords that were willing to do these things. They became Housing First because the state just said, okay, put somebody in those, we'll pay for it. Um, and yes, that is absolutely how Housing First works, and that's what he just asked everybody here to do. Um, but the problem was, by the time the provider received these 45 vouchers, they were already spoken for. Um, and in one way, good, that's 45, at least individuals that are that are off the street overnight, but in another way that means that there's no when those vouchers became available there's no uh, evaluation being done of who is at the highest risk who do we need to put under these roofs most importantly now I don't want to exclude anybody I think that that uh, that should go without saying but there are people who are more likely to die tonight and that's who we that's what housing first is um, so. Um, there, yeah, Housing First exists in Massachusetts. Good luck finding that. Um, you're going to have to turn over a, a lot of rocks, and we will, we will look together. Um, we invite you to be a part of the solution. Um, but it is, a, it is a very good question and a, a very tricky one as well. Um, I have this other question here. Um, and this is a good one. This is complex, and I'll, I'll see what I can do uh, so that everybody can go home and go to bed eventually. Uh, what types of mental health services are available for those who are unhoused and have a diagnosis like autism spectrum disorder? Um, so there's a couple of ways that I could uh, approach this question. I'll let you know. So autism spectrum disorder specifically is a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, so there are services that exist for that specifically that are different from services that exist for other considerations that might fall under the sort of behavioral health umbrella. Autism spectrum disorder on its own does not indicate a need for any acute in, like intervention, right? It's, um, it's something that exists and maybe 
uh, informs the way that people experience the world that they're in and other people in it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to need some really serious uh, treatment of any sort. Uh, it really depends on what kind of distress may be caused by that level of difference. So saying that, um, I think the question as a larger question is a really good one. So interestingly, the kinds of services that are available to people who are unhoused and have various mental health conditions are the same services that are available to anybody in this room with a real big, big asterisk on that. Um, I challenge anybody in this room to go find a therapist right now. Um, yeah, there's a lot of nodding. I asked the right question. Um, it's not available to those of us in here who have private insurance. With mass health, it becomes, I won't say exponentially harder, but the market shifts dramatically because you go from people who are independently licensed and have been in practice for 35 years and they love seeing their favorite clients and they've been seeing them. I've had a therapist for a very long time and I am lucky to have found him when I did. Um, if I was looking today, that might be a little bit more difficult. Um, if you have mass health coverage, which the vast majority of our clients do, um, just purely because of means, um, what you're looking at is not that person who's been in practice for 35 years, but you're looking at the person that's been in practice for 35 minutes. Um, that's okay, because the way the system is designed is that those practitioners have good supervision and good support, and they have a lot of um, support in learning to be that, that experienced practitioner, but if you're thinking maybe there might be some gaps in that, then you're probably right. That's not a smooth transition for everybody. And the, the joke is, okay, you graduate with your social work degree, that's gonna be really good as you go to work at Starbucks every day. It is a hard thing, especially in the basic outpatient therapy world, to get your feet under you doing that and not burn out. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but I got into this and I became a social worker to work with poor people. Show me where the poor people are. I don't need to work with other people. That's what I'm drawn to do, but simply starting and saying, okay, I'm gonna be a therapist now, that is a losing proposition. It, the, the deck is stacked against you, so it is really tough to keep a workforce that's gonna stay in place, and when somebody comes to us and asks for help, well, I can sit down with you on a, on a regular basis if you'd like, um, or we can try to set you up with, I mean, I, I heard somebody today told, being told that they did an intake with somebody and they were told they would get a call in a couple of weeks. That's not actually that bad these days. That's pretty encouraging. I don't know what that call is gonna be in a couple of weeks, but it's at least encouraging that they're gonna get a call. Um, but at that point, they're gonna get matched up with whoever, and that person may get burnt out and be gone in six months. And that is a really, really tough, thing to manage because you, what you wind up with is a population full of people who are used to this churn. Um, I, I could go on, but I guess I think what I'll say and then, and then I'll go away is as long as we're treating these problems um, with a medical model and we are making the services insurance based, we are only ever going to allow for 45 to 50 minute sessions with a therapist. Um, we've allowed providers to go ahead and close tons of services uh, when COVID hit by saying they're not sustainable. Well, guess what? There's half as many services as there were when COVID hit. Um, and we're okay with those being gone. As long as that continues, then we're, we're going to have a lot of trouble with this. And it is, it is catch as catch can in, in, a, in a difficult way. The services are out there. Uh, but they don't look like they used to. Um, we have luck sometimes, we, we struggle in other, in other moments. Um, I know that that is not a real specific answer to this question. I'm really happy to get more specific with anybody who'd like to. I think, Jay, you, I know you have some, yeah. I'll just joke real quick and say, it's the reason I have a pen, is because we struggled, to f we struggled to find partners in the community that could provide the services. Um, that our clients needed, so we decided what we needed to start doing was bring those services in-house. And what started that was actually hiring Ben to be able to start working one-on-one -on -one with our clients on behavioral health needs and to build out behavioral health programming that we can provide in-house. All right. Yeah, <laughs> good work. Chelsea, here. Okay, you got a couple there. Okay. Um, what is the plan for Beverly's homeless during cold inclement weather, also cooling in the summer? Um, so I can't speak on what Beverly's plan is, but what we do, 
So I work closely with our community impact unit um, at the police department, so they'll give me a call when they have someone and it's cold or there's a storm. And if we don't have space downstairs, we'll put a cot up in our dining room um, and fit as many people as we can. We are very small. Um, and then we allow them to stay for the day. If not, we refer them to our day center in Salem or our um, transition center for that. I'm not sure about the summer, but if there's a woman and it's really hot out and she needs to cool off, she can come into the shelter. Uh, I would say we need something here, though. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and is there a plan to help Beverly homeless shower? So again, I can't speak on to that, but all we can do because we are a female shelter is a allow women to shower when they're staying in one of our harm reduction beds. Um, we have allowed women to do laundry there as well. Um, if somebody's in need, we're not going to turn them away. So, But we also do our day center. We have community showers, what, three days a week now in Salem? Yeah. I know, I think we, we need something here. <laughs> Yeah, and, and for those of you in Beverly, you know, um, if you've spoken to people on the streets, one of the places, and this is true in Salem too, um, public libraries are one of the handful of institutions that have doors open for much of the week and have a restroom inside and that will accept the public as walk-ins without a library card. I haven't got to speak yet, but my name is Jason, and I am the president of LifeBridge North Shore. Uh, one of the questions I have here is, what are your thoughts, perspective on local government stance of unhoused populations? Um, well, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of them here today. Right, no, no, I, I, uh, um, I, right, right, yeah, well, well, it's, I don't know if you're going to like the answer, but um, I work very often with many uh, government officials locally, both Beverly, Gloucester, Salem, Lynn. Um, I'd say individually, amazing people, public servants. Uh, you know, most, most of them got into it for the right reasons to serve. Um, there are a few that haven't, right? And, um, but but uh, instead of going city by city and giving my opinion on what their perspective, what the perspective might be, typically they're reactive not proactive. And typically they're motivated by things that maybe those in the social service field or nonprofit sector aren't. So in theory, nonprofits pick up where the government leaves off. So you can sort of see where we tend to want to be complementary as opposed to always in sync. I guess what I'm saying is we don't always agree. Um, what, what I would like to see happen because your local elected officials are a reflection of you, right? So when you ask, well, what are the local elected officials' uh, opinions or, or uh, sorry, what, what is their perspective on these things? Well, it's whatever you all want it to be, right? Because you have the opportunity to pick them and influence them and help them form those opinions. Um, we want to do more of that as well. So I, I'll leave it there. Um, the other second part of this is, in Salem, there is a no-tent policy. Is it harming the unhoused people? Um, that's another really easy question. For, <laughs> um, there's one in Beverly as well, if you're not aware. There's a no-camping ordinance in Beverly. There is not one yet. Probably by the end of this week, there will be one in Salem. Um, they're, they're different. We always talk about them as no-camping ordinances, but every city has the right to have a different ordinance. Uh, the one in Salem, uh, LifeBridge has been pretty intimately involved in, and it is one that has this, I think, uh, amazing caveat here. It's, you know, we will not take down tents unless we provide other options for housing or shelter for those individuals first. So in theory, the ordinance doesn't go into effect until we have the capacity to serve the people we would be displacing, all right? That is not how it is here, you know, and that's just, wasn't how it was written. Um, this is something that is in front of the Supreme Court right now. They argued this two weeks ago, and a few of us sat and listened to the oral arguments, and it's a grants pass, or um, what's the other one? Uh, the, yeah, I can't think of, uh, but it's Ninth Circuit Court, West Coast. 
they said, hey, you know, under the cruel and unusual clause in the Constitution, you can't move people out of tents unless you provide them something better. Now, that only applies to the Ninth Circuit, which is over in the West Coast. It really doesn't apply to the East Coast. Once the Supreme Court rules, it will. And we'll see where they fall. And there's some speculation as to what they'll do. I suspect they will turn that power back over to the local governments, as been their uh, rulings as of late. So that means as community members, we may have a chance to influence what those ordinances are. Do they hurt unhoused people? Yes, done the wrong way, absolutely. Um, could this be something that, I mean, in Salem, I'll tell you right now, there's, you know, encampments just like homeless populations vary from, from place to place. There are the folks that we intimately call the survivors. You know, they're out there, they live in a tent, they have their setup. They try to stay out of people's way. They probably wouldn't tell you where they are if you asked. You know, you'd probably have to stumble upon them. They keep to themselves, and we serve those folks a lot. They're very, in, they interact a lot with us. Um, there's another set of encampments, and these are the ones we, you know, we're seeing uh, pop up in your neighbors here in Salem. You know, group of folks, um, typically younger, trending younger. Uh, we had an upwards of 40 of those folks in just one encampment off the river, and that's what prompted the as I said, local officials are reactive. So, of course, we're reacting. And, you know, we're looking at this ordinance. And um, that's a little different. I think something has to be done. I don't think this is the perfect solution. But we do work with those individuals on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Dr. Lukens talked about Mike King. He's down there with two other staff almost daily. And, unfortunately, the behavior down there is unhealthy. Um, it is something that we would like to, as a community, do better on. And in order to respond to that, we have, in Salem, launched what you've heard is the transition site. It's an additional 50 beds. We actually had to close half of our thrift shop to put 50 beds down. Um, and again, it's hopefully for these folks that are in those encampments. Sorry for the long answer, but two good questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Okay, um, so I have a question that is pretty related to Beverly and I, I definitely want to address it. It's three parts, so I'll read all three and then kind of just talk about them. The first is, is Beverly bootstraps associated with Family Promise? If so, how? The second is, what can the Beverly Council on Aging be doing to help? And the third is, what can the Beverly Commission on Disabilities do to help? Um, and I think what I said earlier when I said Beverly lacks resources, I want to kind of explain that because Beverly doesn't necessarily lack resources for Beverly, but what they lack is resources for the whole community that we are truly in it to serve together. Because what happens when towns kind of stick to their own town, then where does everybody else go? And so organizations like LifeBridge end up being kind of like the melting pot that gets people from all over. We serve all of Essex County, and the nine families that I mentioned in the last three weeks that were Beverly families is a small percentage on all of the other families we were serving. So what Beverly really lacks is resources, resources that can serve wider communities. And the reality is, is we all are responsible for ending homelessness in Massachusetts, everywhere. It's, it's not just a town by town basis because every town is gonna have a different response and if we're just like, well no, we're only gonna focus on Beverly folks, um, it can get a little dicey. And so Bootstraps and a lot of organizations that you know, I think everyone is familiar with, the YMCA, Bootstraps, St. Vincent de Paul, we have a very active St. Vincent de Paul Society here in Beverly, um, which is connected to the Good Friday Walk, which I know many of you are aware of, and then the Council on Aging, the library, I appreciate you for mentioning that because they do a ton of work there that I think they, nobody signed up to do. Um, so these organizations, uh, we work closely with Bootstraps. Bootstraps does a lot. They focus on food, um, they do have some housing pieces, but I think a lot of agencies are doing more than they necessarily can or should be doing. So when you look at, um, we work with teachers, teachers call us and teachers become social workers because there aren't enough social workers. Um, they're obviously not like licensed social workers, but they're doing similar work. They're trying to help families access housing. They're filling out housing applications. They have no idea how to do it. They're calling us, asking for help. Um, Bootstraps has a lot of different programs. They do a lot of rental assistance or at least helping families apply for rental assistance. And our sole focus is um, advocacy case management 
So we work strictly with um, housing and, and shelter. So a lot of times bootstraps will have a Beverly family that needs something and we'll kind of be like, great, you guys take it because um, we're working with other families as well. But we refer back and forth. You know, if we don't have funding for something, we'll send someone to bootstraps. And they do have some case managers that help with these things. They serve a handful of towns in Essex County. Um, so I think, you know, the questions about the Council on Aging and um, the Commission on Disabilities, these organizations, I've had calls from people who work at uh, various COAs and they're doing the same thing too. They're like, I'm working with the family, I have no idea how to get them housing, can you help me? Um, and the reality is, is like, what can these organizations do? You're, they're already trying because the need is so great and so outrageously out of control that everyone is scrambling to figure it out and it's falling on organizations, nonprofits that do not have the resources resources to, to navigate the level of need that exists. So when I say there's a lack of resources, there's a lack of resources for the level of need that exists. Um, but I would say for councils on aging and those types of groups, like collaborate with all the nonprofits should be talking constantly. And it's not happening as much as it should. And that's kind of it. There's duplication of services when we don't communicate. So I think those types of organizations having as much communication with possible as possible um, is the best way to approach things. And so when people go to the Council on Aging, the Council on Aging has LifeBridge on speed dial and can talk to them about how to navigate shelter for someone who is seeking assistance. So I'd say collaboration is key. Thank you, Rachel. All right, we're getting close and we'll turn you out while there's still a little daylight. Um, but Jason Etheridge, President of LifeBridge, is going to make some remarks, and then I'm going to come up and I'm going to ask you all something before we break. Oh, so, yeah. Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, batting cleanup for this crew is uh, pretty, pretty amazing. I'm humbled. Um, before I start, uh, the four people in front of you from the various age, LifeBridge and Family Promise, um, those are the real heroes in the room tonight. Uh, they're on the ground. And Talk about people who wake up every day with the desire to serve, um, and uh, they inspire me. I, I sometimes get to be the conductor, you know, that's I feel my role, but um, I am I'm honored to be among them. So thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for ta having the courage to have a difficult conversation. Um, it's amazing uh, to, to be able to break this open a little more. Um, you know, we're not here, despite how it may feel, to make everyone feel hopeless or dismayed. Um, you know, quite the opposite, actually. We want to lift the curtain. We want to start an honest conversation. We want to get the community excited about talking about what might be next. You know, what we're facing now is, is not new. It's, it's years and years and years of failed policy and an overconfidence in a broken system. Homelessness is complex. It's a complex community problem that requires a complex community solution. No single organization, no single person, no single church. No, there's complex. We all have to be part of it. And it's fairly easy for me to sit up here and you know, we, we, we talk about homelessness and homeless all the time. Um, and I, I love that Chelsea humanized this, for, for lack of a better term for this. But what you heard a lot of tonight was about people, right? We're every time we talk about homelessness, we're talking about people. Women who are suffering from domestic violence, adolescents struggling to find access to behavioral mental health services, families living in cars. I can't tell you how many families we encounter living in cars now, beyond anything we've ever seen. And people's sons and daughters, at the very least, everyone that we work with is someone's son or daughter who are begging for sleeping bags so that they can sleep unsheltered at night without freezing to death. And that's where we're at. You know, while organizations like Family Promise and uh, their fearless leader, Rachel, and LifeBridge and its committed leadership of Jonathan, Ben, and Chelsea, you know, they show up every day and they're dedicated to serving the most vulnerable among us. But we are only able to triage the problem at best. This is not to take credit away. But despite all of the amazing successes and progresses our organizations have, on our best days, we can do little to address the root causes that have brought 
our communities to a place that is experiencing an increase in homelessness at a rate not ever seen before. And how can I say that? It comes right out of the HUD point in time count, which I think is grossly underestimated. 653,000 people experiencing homelessness on a single night in January of 2023. That is the highest number of people reported as, as experiencing homelessness on a single night since we started counting in 2007. And it's 2023. My friends, that was more than a year ago. It's only gotten a lot worse. You know, it's been an honor to, to sort of listen and, and watch and respond to some of the questions. I hope there are more. But, you know, we can leave knowing we took one of the first and essential steps, which is acknowledging and recognizing the problem. We have lots of work to do, and we're hoping, you know, you're all considering how you might be able to help. You know, it has to start somewhere in every community, uh, so why not here, why not now, is always my question. Let's not, fall, let's not leave tonight and fall into that trap of simply have admiring the problem. Eleven years ago, when I became interim executive director at LifeBridge, um, I had a lot more hair, I was skinnier, um, and uh, uh, you know, I bought into a vision that really called for the end of shelters and focused more on increasing the opportunities uh, for those who need housing and increasing housing opportunities for those who need for those who need them. You know, I wish I could stand here tonight and say we are closer to realizing that vision. Um, rather, I stand here and can report that on any given night, we have up to 100 people sleeping in our shelters in Salem, individuals. Um, that's double than where we were even three years ago. Um, and we have more than 60 individuals who show up every day at our great centers in Salem and Gloucester looking for the most basic of services. Most of those folks do not get shelter beds. Um, so sadly, uh, we're, we're much far away from closing any shelters and, and exchanging that for a, a more dignified solution, which would be housing. But now we're desperate for more shelter beds and we're even more desperate for more day centers. So I will leave it up to our amazing hosts for this evening, which we, we have a lot of gratitude for, and all of you here tonight to think and hopefully speak about what's next. You know, everyone up here is ready. We're ready. We're ready to be part of whatever this community would like to do to serve our unsheltered neighbors. And I'm going to leave you with some words that, uh, you know, uh, someone I find a lot of inspiration in when I get to do these things, and it's uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And so you probably know this one. And if not, you should. Um, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an ins inescapable network of mutuality, tied in the single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Thank you. All right. Three things. First, a bunch of thanks. Thanks to Rachel, Jonathan, Ben, Chelsea, and Jason for sharing your knowledge of our community, our neighbors, and their needs. Special thanks to Susie Jordan and Gary Barrett and their LifeBridge colleagues for event planning and production help. Thanks to Reverend Elizabeth and the staff and many volunteers at First Parish for hosting us here. And this is the community's historic meeting place. It, it happened to roll into a UU church, but, but as we've heard tonight, this is not any one church or any one of us challenge. This is a whole community challenge, so it's nice to be back in a place that has its roots in the history of the community. Um, and to Terry Slater, Mike Keith Feldman for helping to get the word out, and to Bev Cam for coming on such short notice. Thank you for being here. For those, for your friends who didn't make it, this will be on Bev Cam YouTube, and I think we'll get a link out for people who may want to see parts or all of this. Um, thanks to LifeBridge and Family Promise for the support these organizations, along with our local supper hosts and the faith community um, and other service organizations here in Beverly and throughout the region provide to so many who need it. After hearing all of this today, 
What we need for you to do is to call Mayor Kale and your city councilors and let them know that it's important to you to know that what they are doing to support our unhoused and housing insecure neighbors in Beverly in a clear and compassionate way. Let them know after everything you've heard why this is important to you. It starts there. This is a big problem. It won't fix easily. But we need to make our, our desires known and we need to get to work at it. So once again, thank you all for spending your evening here with us tonight. And we wish you good work ahead.